Hello everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our NEETEC COVID-19 webinar series. Uh, today's program is called Resiliency, Riding the Wave of COVID. So very eager about our couple of speakers today who you've heard briefly from before, but they're going to have the opportunity to go a lot more in depth today. So that'll be great for, for all of us who know how important this issue is to healthcare. So I'm Shelley Sweethelm and I'm a nurse from Nebraska Medicine and I have a program uh, director role in the uh, National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, otherwise known as NETEC, and also serve as a subject matter expert uh, for varying uh, components within NETEC. So next slide. Today's our, our agenda is listed there for you. So quick welcome and then we're going to get started with our speakers and then I'll share just a couple of resources at the end that might be of interest and move on to questions and answers uh, with uh, these speakers today. So the, the need tech mission statement is in, to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. Next slide. This just gives you a, a big picture view of some of the activities that NETEC uh, supports and everything from assessment, self-assessment tools, metrics, to education, whether that's in-person courses, a webinar like today, or many online trainings that also have continuing education credits uh, through our learning management system uh, portal on our website. We provide technical assistance, so you're able to uh, ask questions via the website and get technical assistance feedback. We have customizable exercise templates, a robust repository with lots of tools and resources. And then we've also created a research infrastructure uh, to be able to uh, optimally uh, take advantage of having a central IRB and lots of other uh, resources uh, to um, be able to deploy quickly medical countermeasures as they evolve. Next slide. So it's my privilege to hand over to our first speaker today, uh, Dr. David Cates, who is the Director of Behavioral Health at Nebraska Medicine, and he also serves a very important role as really a coach and mentor to all of our staff here in the biocontainment unit and quarantine center, as well as out on the front lines uh, in our health system. So with that, Dr. Cates, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, so in April, uh, we did a presentation for NETEC on supporting the workforce, and we called it Care of the Caregiver. And now, about two and a half months later, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to uh, share what we've learned and what we've done since that time. And because not everyone heard that original webinar, I'll take just a few minutes to get you up to speed, and then we'll talk about the lessons learned and the changes in our approach. So first, I'm gonna briefly review the challenges for healthcare workers in a pandemic. Uh, then I'll highlight some of the risk factors for psychological distress. And then I'll quickly review the interventions that I shared in April and then discuss what we've learned since then and the additional interventions that we've developed in response. So what types of challenges are our healthcare workers facing during this pandemic? Again, I reviewed it in April, so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but briefly, uh, there may be concerns about proper use of PPE and infection control protocols. There can be times when things feel disorganized and staff are not clear on their roles due to all of the changes in protocols and in where and how patients with COVID-19 are cohorted. So many institutions have restructured EDs and inpatient units, including bringing staff together who don't normally work with each other. And I'll say that in my conversations with inpatient staff over the past couple of months, for the majority of them, it's the issues with staffing, including not having a consistent team, uh, that stresses the staff the most even more than working with COVID-19 patients per se. And with the changes in protocols and the restructuring of units, there are of course changes in workflows and responsibilities which inevitably cause stress and sometimes confusion. Of course, there are the ongoing concerns about limited resources and supplies. When institutions have a surge of critically ill patients that outstrip available resources like ICU beds and ventilators, they may have to adopt crisis standards of care, 
such as deciding not to treat someone they would normally be able to save. And this is enormously stressful and can be traumatic for providers and can lead to what we call moral injury, which we discussed in the last webinar. There's separation from usual colleagues. So we've had a lot of staff floating to other units. And again, this type of disruption to normal teams has been among the most stressful components of the response effort. Witnessing the death of patients, especially in this uh, pandemic when family members can't be present and staff are essentially a substitute family member at the bedside while also trying to manage a virtual goodbye with the family. Illness and death in colleagues. So this is always upsetting and can also be traumatic and healthcare workers can find themselves caring for colleagues as patients. There can be challenging team dynamics, of course, fear of contracting the illness, concerns for the safety of family and friends. Some healthcare workers may feel misunderstood and forced to justify their work commitment to their family and friends. And again, related to all the restructuring and floating of staff, there can be stress with re-entry to regular work groups. There can be stigmatization around working with COVID patients, fatigue and limited rest time, personal and team pressure to succeed in care of patients, and self-doubt. And the more of these challenges that healthcare workers face, the increased likelihood of experiencing distress. Now, most healthcare workers are resilient and will not experience lasting distress. However, depending on what happens during the response, 10 to 20% of healthcare workers are at risk for a new disorder they didn't have before the event. And this is based on research with disaster responders usually after a circumscribed event like a tornado or a hurricane. The current pandemic is different, and as I'll mention in a moment, there are some features that suggest that the level of distress and even psychiatric morbidity may be higher. And problems we see in disaster responders, again, usually a small percentage of them, include post-traumatic stress, insomnia, substance use, depression, and anxiety. And it's important to note that symptoms can occur after the outbreak is under control. The good news is that symptoms usually decrease over time, but we can have relapses, especially if there's a pre-existing mental health condition, and with re-exposure to additional infectious disease outbreaks, such as a possible second wave in the fall or the winter. Now, I shared this study last time, and I won't go into it in detail, but this is data on healthcare workers in China after the outbreak in Wuhan. It shows substantial psychological fallout, including 35% endorsing moderate to severe symptoms of distress on a scale that usually, uh, or that basically assesses for symptoms of acute stress disorder and PTSD. In other words, the impact of event scale used here overlaps substantially with the symptoms in the DSM four at the time it was developed uh, for acute stress disorder and PTSD. So that is suggestive of significant uh, distress among our healthcare workers. There are many risk factors for psychological distress, but I just wanna highlight four. One is perception of heightened risk of infection. Another is a longer duration of high risk exposure. And if you think about just these two, perception of heightened risk of infection, and longer duration of high-risk exposure, the COVID-19 pandemic really is the perfect storm. Additional risk factors are a previous history of psychiatric illness and a lack of social support. So it was for all of these reasons that at Nebraska Medicine and UNMC, we developed a comprehensive workforce support plan, which I presented in April, and which you can view in the NETEC repository. Uh, so I'll just review quickly what the key interventions uh, were, actually are, because we're still doing them. One are resilience workshops. So these are 60 minute interactive workshops for teams to learn resiliency and stress management skills. One-to-one -one support with a behavioral health colleague. So this is not formal assessment, it's not therapy, but it's a one-to-one -one contact with a behavioral health clinician who can listen, offer suggestions, share resources, and make referrals if necessary. We have a referral line that our staff can call to identify resources for behavioral health or other social services. 
We put together a variety of intranet resources, including links to websites and to apps that teach relaxation skills, tip sheets on a variety of topics like managing stress, working from home and helping children, as well as other resources. We are prioritizing our frontline providers for services within our psychiatry and psychology departments where there's normally a little bit of a wait. And we talked about interventions to prevent moral injury and the key role of institutional leadership in promoting resilience. And by the way, this is where you can uh, view the April Care of the Caregiver website and where you can download resources to implement the one-to-one -one peer support and the resilience workshop. So we include here PowerPoints that we use for training our behavioral health teams. Also the PowerPoint that we use in the resilience workshop itself and uh, the resilience roadmap. That's, that's the handout that we use in the workshop. And you can also view videos of the actual trainings and there's a video of a resilience workshop itself if anybody is interested. So what have we learned? Well, first the resilience workshops have been popular. So we've completed 50 of them so far mostly for clinical groups, but also for some non-clinical groups like our severely stretched IT professionals and our nursing leadership team. And what's been nice is that the word spread among our managers and directors, and my sense is that the managers saw everyone else doing it for their teams and thought, you know, we should have one too. So a little bit of that FOMO, fear of missing out, may be helping to spread the word. And one tip uh, when managers or clinical team leaders call to schedule these is to try to work them into existing meetings. Uh, so for example, a couple of the academic departments at the university, um, you know, where the faculty are, the docs in those departments, they use their grand rounds time for the resilience workshop, which ensured that attendance was high. So what about our one-to-one -one peer support program? Initially, the Peers in Need of Support program was, in my view, underutilized. So in the first three months, we had about 30 self-referrals and my sense is that this is far less than the actual need and in talking with other institutions nationally it seems this is typical for self-referral programs and it got us thinking about how we can be more proactive about reaching out to those who may be in distress rather than waiting for them to come to us and we thought back to a meeting that we had years ago with the human resources team from union pacific railroad which is headquartered here in omaha and they told us about their peer support program. And evidently it's fairly common for people to attempt suicide by uh, putting themselves in front of a train. And these incidents, uh, incidents are of course extremely upsetting and potentially traumatic for the train engineers. So at Union Pacific, they don't wait for the engineers to ask for help. They automatically assign a trained peer to reach out every time this happens. So, we decided that any time a patient dies on a COVID unit, that we'll have the manager reach out to that primary nurse within 24 hours, and then one of our behavioral health team members reaches out in 72 hours. And there's a second group of employees we decided to be proactive about reaching out to, and that's our team members in quarantine and isolation. So the literature on quarantine and isolation indicates that they are potentially highly distressing especially for healthcare providers. Our helicopter taking off in the background, just close the window. Um, so what we did is uh, every time that we have a healthcare provider placed in quarantine or isolation, our employee health team alerts us and we reach out once in the beginning and a second time about five to seven days later. The other thing we did to be more proactive is we created an additional program, a new program with different responders called the Proactive Peer Support Program. And so for this program, we trained over 50 employees who were identified by their managers as informal leaders. So these are not behavioral health providers, but we train them in how to identify signs of stress in their colleagues and how to reach out and then to listen and make some type of plan together. And that might be just identifying a coping strategy that usually works for their colleague, or suggesting a new coping tool, or recommending they contact the peers in need of support program I just talked about, or talk to their supervisor, or, or simply agreeing just to check in again. So the idea here is that this person is a resource 
for their natural work group. So we're not asking them to provide support to anyone other than the people with whom they usually work. And so basically we are embedding support within existing work groups. And we make sure that the manager lets everyone in the work group know that this individual is serving in this proactive peer support role. And this serves as a license of sorts for them to then reach out to their colleagues, which can otherwise be awkward. And I've had two uh, follow-up meetings. Uh, so these monthly meetings with this group of proactive peer supporters. And from those meetings, it sounds to me like they're doing a great job connecting with and supporting their colleagues. Um, so I've been collecting some data in those meetings. So this is from the first meeting and you can see the graphs on the right there. So the top graph shows, for example, that seven of the peer supporters had reached out to three colleagues. Four of them had reached out to between six and 10 colleagues. Two had reached out to more than 10 colleagues. And the bottom graph shows the average number of contacts for any given peer who they supported. So the modal number of contacts is one, but in many instances, peer supporters are having more than one contact per peer, which indicates that they're following up after that initial contact. And uh, I did collect the same data last week in our second meeting and things look pretty much the same. So if you're interested, by the way, the materials that we used to train these proactive peer supporters are also available in that same NETEC webpage that I just sh showed you before. So you can see the PowerPoint that we used to train the peer supporters. And I actually videoed our, you know, the, the training itself, so you can actually see an actual training um, if you're interested in adopting that strategy. Another proactive form of support that we initiated is rounding in the COVID unit break rooms. So we have a behavioral health provider stop by several times a week to build rapport and check on staff well-being. We provide support and we remind staff of the various wellness resources that we have available. And most weeks we then send around a set of wellness tips based on the information we're hearing in the break room that week. So for example, a couple of weeks, there's a lot of uh, people talking about difficulty sleeping, insomnia towards the beginning of the response. So, you know, we wrote up uh, some tips on sleep hygiene, um, you know, made sure that people knew what apps were available, the CBTI app for sleep. So um, we try to tailor those tips to what's going on at the time. The final uh, addition to our original suite of interventions is support groups. And we started two of them. One was originally for the COVID unit staff, but we recently opened it up to all inpatient staff as the staff in our non-COVID units are subject to many of the same stressors, including those changes in workflow and team composition. We also started a group for our physician and advanced practice provider critical care and hospitalist teams. And these are facilitated by behavioral health professionals. And uh, you might be thinking, well, he just talked about these proactive groups and you know, support groups are not proactive. It, in, you know, in court, it means people have to sign up for it and go to it, and that's true. And, and as we predicted, uh, based on what we've learned about self-referral programs, attendance has been low, usually between like three and five people. But we believe that those who are attending are benefiting, and for that reason, we are continuing to offer them. But uh, if there is one lesson learned that I'd like to convey, it's to be proactive in supporting your workforce. So we can't wait for employees to self-identify and seek out services. We, we have to go to them, whether that's reaching out to a nurse who lost a patient, reaching out to a doctor in quarantine, training non-behavioral health professionals to identify and help colleagues in distress, or having a behavioral health provider plop down in the COVID unit break room to chat with staff. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Cunningham, but I will stick around for any questions at the end. I would like to, before I introduce myself, um, reiterate the importance of David's last message and being proactive. David, thank you for the work that you do. Um, the, this is the soft stuff in many ways. And because it's the soft stuff, it's also the hardest to measure and I think doesn't get the um, uh, support it needs as we care for each other, as we care for our colleagues, and as we care for our systems, ultimately. So being proactive is absolutely key and not only proactive for the individual, but as systems leaders, we need to constantly be proactive to think about 
what changes can we make at a systems level to reduce some of the stressors on our providers? There was a question earlier in Q&A about staffing. So not only is resilience all about the individual, it's also about the system and how can we as systems leaders change that and support our, our staff better. My name is Tim Cunningham. I'm the Vice President of Practice and Innovation at Emory Healthcare. I'm an emergency nurse by training. Um, I did my doctoral work uh, in public health on caregiver resilience in um, humanitarian settings. And before that, I was a hospital clown. I worked for the Big Apple Circus at Boston Children's Hospital. And believe it or not, that first career as a professional actor and performer is where I learned often the most about resilience. What can lead a child who's sick as stink to sit up in bed in a PICU and smile? What do we have as individuals and as community groups within us that can evoke a sense of strength even when things seem to be completely falling apart? So today I wanna to walk through a few ideas about ways of building resilience, a concept called post-traumatic growth that I would like to share and put out there, um, and share a couple practices that can be both used at the individual level and also the group level. But most importantly, before I begin this work, I would like to acknowledge that there are certain and, and palpable stressors because of COVID globally. And I would say, especially in Atlanta, even more pressing are stressors that our community and staff are facing because of the acute on chronic racial injustice in our country. Chronic being the ongoing racism in this country since the its founding and the acute measures as we see again the innocent deaths of black men and women because of race-based crime. And I want to say that A, to acknowledge our colleagues of color and all of our colleagues as we face a different stress and an added stress on top of COVID. So as we look at resilience, resilience is not specifically for COVID, but it's for the big picture as we move together and acknowledge each other. We have a term that many people are using called the new normal. And this new normal looks like this. My colleague, Dr. Tim Porter O'Grady, considers it constructing tomorrow. So as we construct our tomorrow together in this time when we are all wearing masks, or should be, when our faces are covered, when we have PPE preventing us from connecting the same way we used to connect as caregivers, there's a completely other higher level of stress added on to the work that we do. Thank goodness we're not wearing the plague masks back in the day, but I would argue that our PPE and covering does create a sense of fear, both between us and the people we're caring for, as well as each other. If anyone's read Camus' The Plague, and I was an English major before I got into healthcare, and, and I think there's so many brilliant connections in the arts on how we can learn to care for each other and be more compassionate. If you've not read out Albert Camus' The Plague, I highly recommend, especially in this time, because I think he nails it, even though his work is a work of fiction. He reminds us that a loveless world is a dead world. And I am concerned that through the disconnect that we are placing in front of us to keep us safe, we are losing that sense of love and compassion and connection. Therefore, we need to build resilience. As David mentioned, we all come to our professions with resilience. That's for certain. The National Academy of Medicine in their uh, report on caregiver well-being talks about this, that as humans, we all have resilience. But we also know as care providers, we need a little bit more. And in times like this year, we need a whole lot more. When we talk about resilience and I give talks on it, people, I often ask, what does resilience mean to you? And people say, bouncing back, bouncing back so that you can reface stressors, reface adversity. And one day I was sharing this conversation with a colleague of mine named Florence Lansana, and she said, well, Tim, what if bouncing back is more about bouncing back to where you came from? When you face a stressor, bouncing back to remember what brought you here in the first place. Here I quote Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the author of Americana, an amazing novel. And she suggests that, what is the home that we came from? So if we had more time and we were doing a full, you know, couple hour workshop, I would ask you to take a moment to reflect on these two questions. What brought you to our profession? 
and what you, brings you strength in the work that you do. And I encourage you just to take, take a moment to think about that. And also, as we think about this work at the individual level of resilience, as well as the, the systems level, could these be some practices that you take, you take to your teams and have conversations around them? Another aspect of resilience building comes from the literature around narrative medicine. So I want to try something with you all. I see we've got 265 people here, so we'll see how this goes. I brought up a slide of an image that was painted by my colleague, Diala Brisley. She and I just published a children's book about Ebola and resilience. And um, she painted this picture and shared it with me and encouraged me to share with my other colleagues. So what I'd like you to do, if you feel comfortable, is take a look and in the chat function, again, the chat function, not the Q&A, I'd ask you to type out what comes to mind first. And what do you see when you look at this picture? And I'll read it out as the chats come through. Suffering, suffering, strength, a trans woman to man, pain and suffering, a child lost, injured child, surviving ECMO, courage, illness, exhaustion, strength, struggle, a child who can't be a child, floating, moving forward, Buried, darkness, suffering, pain, walking through adversity, scrawny, trying to survive, trying to keep moving through the pain, seeking help, sadness, keeping on one's journey despite hardships. This is awesome. Thank you all. As you look at this picture, I'll ask you to focus now a little more closely on the child's eyes. What do you see? And if you can zoom on your screen, if you're on a smartphone, zoom in. What do you see when you focus on this child, child's eyes? And go ahead and toss that into the chat box. I see the word despair. I see the word tired. I see sadness and pain. Determination, looking up, please help me. Hope, frustration, looking for God, looking for something, exhaustion, seeking help, need for help, hope, asking for help. Now, someday when COVID is over and perhaps I get to meet some of you all in person. We'll do a similar exercise and we can see each other's faces as we reflect on this art and as we do a close viewing of this image. But what I find interesting is that in reading the chat box, there's a dichotomy. I see words like despair, weakness, fatigue, sadness, but I also see words like hope, moving through adversity. They're positive words and negative words all coming from the same image. A little more background on this image. As I mentioned, my colleague Diala Brisley painted this. This is a photograph that she's found on Google Images. And there was a photograph of a child walking through a hospital in Syria that had recently been bombed. Now, Diala is Syrian. Her brother was murdered in the early days of the war in 2013. Her family fled and she recently has gotten asylum in France. Um, with our book out, I've been working hard to get her to come to the U.S., but with our current immigration policies, that's been impossible. But when she saw this picture of this child, in the actual image, the child was walking down a hallway, the IV bags were dragging behind him, his wound vax and wound bags following his lead. But Diala noticed his eyes were looking upwards. And for her, that gave her a sense of hope. So instead of IV and fluid bags, she painted a heart and a kite as symbols of things that lift us up. If you look to the left of the picture, she painted instead of wound, wound drains, she painted family portraits, all connected, deeply connected to this child. And for her, this was a story of a child moving forward into strength. I share this image for two reasons with you all. For one, I think it's important for all of us as individuals, as teams, to pause amidst the chaos of COVID and the constant go, 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 to flip our brains a little bit and engage with the arts, to talk about something different and to take time to analyze something in a different and more abstract way. And there's some evidence that that can actually reduce stress over time. We know in our medical students in their third year of medical training, there is a significant drop in empathy scores and altruism scores. 
There's one small study of nursing students. Again, it's a small study that I found, so it's certainly not the end-all be-all, but it suggests similarly that our nursing and medical students, as they come through training, by the time they step into the clinical care on their own or with less supervision, they're already a little burnt out and have lost a sense of empathy. What I think is interesting is that we're learning that there's a small but growing body of evidence around narrative medicine practices that by close engagement with the arts, whether it's literature, whether it's visual arts, performing arts or musical, can increase attention scores, can increase empathy scores. Now again, small body of evidence and a lot of work to do, but as we consider resilience building amongst our teams, it might not be as complicated as it needs to be. Jim Austin, neuroscientist and a pretty extraordinary guy. He's in his mid nineties now, started writing books, I believe in his late forties. He's got six published um, and is a, a Zen meditator, suggests a very simple tool on, we can how, <clears throat> on how we can begin to build resilience. If you notice the photograph of the child on the left, this was taken by my colleague, Dr. Nazneen Udin, when we were working in a Rohingya, <clears throat> in a Rohingya refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar um, in 20, I guess this was 2017 now. And she got <clears throat> permission from the child to take this photograph. She also got permission from the child's parents. But this child looking up is something that when we were wor working in the clinic there, Though we witnessed extreme suffering and heard horrific stories of families who had escaped the geno genocide in Myanmar, we still would leave the clinic and see children playing, looking upwards, flying kites. Austin's research goes in to suggest what that might mean. He talks about our attention systems, and I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm not going to go into too much depth on this. But basically, what I've learned from Dr. Austin's work is that when we're thinking, <clears throat> we're constantly switching between our dorsal attention system and our ventral attention system. And you can see the regions of the brain where those regions would light up on fMRI or MRI. So we're thinking back and forth between these attention systems. Our dorsal attention system, which is more associated with the evolved brain, allows us to focus, to pinpoint our focus more clearly. So for example, if you're studying for your boards, you're going to spend more time in your dorsal attention system so you can remember verbatim, if needed, details that you yourself can take forward to pass this exam in these boards. Conversely, when we spend time in our ventral attention system, that's more associated with taking in the space around us. We think of fight or flight. You hear a loud sound. You notice where the entrances and exits. How is everyone on my team? What do I need to do? You're in a code situation. You know where your equipment is, where your teammates are and what's going on. That's your ventral attention. Austin goes further to suggest that when we spend time in our dorsal attention system, those thoughts are more associated with the ego-centric mind. Me, myself, and I, right? Makes sense. Let me focus on this thing so I can pass my exam and, and, and proceed in my medical training. Conversely, the ventral attention system, according to Austin's work, is associated with the allo-centric mind, allo Greek for other. How do I relate to others around me? His research goes one further step and has found that or suggests that we can control which attention system we are spending more time thinking in by where we turn our eyes. By turning our eyes upwards, we can engage the ventral attention system more regularly. Again, you're back and forth, back and forth, but more regularly than your dorsal attention system. And conversely, by looking downwards, we engage the dorsal attention system, the ego-centric mind. So think about your daily work. In which direction are you often looking? Down towards your smartphone, down towards the computer in front of you. Think about what it feels like to walk outside and look up at the clouds or look up at a child flying a kite and how you feel and how you connect that way. Behind the mask, we are much more encouraged to look down and focus and lose that sense of connection. So as we think about resilience, it's already inherent within us, as David mentioned earlier. 
but how do we bring that forward and work to take in the space around us and those connections? Austin's work also looks at breathing and the practice of breathing. We know when we breathe in and we breathe out, there is a pause between our exhalation and our next inhalation. It's triggered by the brainstem, it's natural, it happens. We also know that long-term meditators can extend that pause between the exhalation and the next inhalation. What we are learning is that there is an emotion associated with that pause between the in-breath or between the out-breath and the next in-breath. And that emotion is associated with tenderness. Again, these are small studies, but if this research holds, imagine that with every breath that you take as an individual, your brain is automatically triggering you back to a sense, even if it's for milliseconds, nanoseconds of tenderness. When we consider the stressors that our care providers are facing in our country today, in our world today, when things feel completely overwhelming at times, when we realize there is an increasing rate in post-traumatic stress disorder, in, in suicidality of caregivers, to go back and know that perhaps with every breath there is a moment of tenderness, how can we work with that as leaders and colleagues and mentors to look at how we root ourselves in resilience and that it can begin with each breath? Then the trick is to bring it forward. I'd like to talk a little bit about a concept now called post-traumatic growth. And I want to begin with a statement that might be a bold statement, and I, I don't hope to offend, but I'm concerned in healthcare that we are often quick to pathologize suffering, meaning that we know that our caregivers are witnessing primary trauma, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma because of everything going on around us. And sometimes I think we jump to conclusions that now our warriors are wounded. And it's through those wounds that we have to work and, and, and provide support. Now, PTSD is real and it needs attention and we need to care for our colleagues that are suffering from it. But there's a little bit less literature about this concept post-traumatic growth, but I think it's also real and also something that we might wanna consider in recognition that globally, we have all been traumatized by COVID. So post-traumatic growth in some ways is associated with post-traumatic stress disorder because it comes forward from trauma experienced, but post-traumatic growth begins with asking questions and focusing in on what is personal strength that came from your traumatic experience, whether it's a lifetime of trauma or a specific trauma. What are closer relationships that you may be experiencing now? Greater appreciation for life. What is that to you? New possibilities. Thinking about health systems that have been crushed by COVID. Coming from Emory's perspective, we have found countless new possibilities on how we manage healthcare and run healthcare. Let's celebrate that. And if you're a spiritual person, profound spiritual growth can come from post-traumatic growth. Again, post-traumatic growth is not a way to, to move away from post-traumatic stress disorder, but I would ask that we consider as we move forward in our traumas together, that we also look at what strengths have come and celebrate those strengths. And as we do resiliency sessions, as we do one-on-ones, how can we make sure we're supporting our colleagues and teams to help them see some of the light in a place where things are extremely dark? This is a photograph that my colleague Bex Rollins from Partners in Health took in 2015. Um, I'm especially grateful to have the opportunity to present with you all because um, I spent uh, nine weeks in late 2014 and early 2015 treating Ebola patients in Sierra Leone as a frontline nurse. This is a photograph that Bex took of me actually um, holding a child who uh, an ambulance had pulled into our Ebola treatment unit. Um, mother, father, child, and an older sibling were in the back of the ambulance. They were all sick as stink. We sprayed down the back of the ambulance and opened the door. Literally, the mother held the child out towards us, and she fainted as holding the child. And we physically caught the child so the child did not hit the ground and assessed the family, all of whom were uh, positive for Ebola. Fortunately, they all survived. I show this picture to remind us that though COVID is new, 
though this novel virus is, is, is pertinent, this isn't the first time around the globe that we have seen pandemic. Maybe to this scale, for sure. This also isn't the first time that we have had nations that have been on lockdown. My colleagues in Sierra Leone, who I speak with frequently, were on lockdown for two plus years. And in the US, we're what, 60, 70 days, and we're already pushing to open, to open, to open. So I share this picture and I share this thought taken from the Book of Joy, which is a fabulous book if you have the chance to read it, that there's a Tibetan saying that wisdom is like rainwater. Both gather in the low places. And a profound challenge as we look at caregiver well-being as resilience for individuals and systems when it comes to our COVID response is that if we think about the literature and the research that's out there that we base much of our evidence on or our evidence-based practices, comes from resource wealthy locations. And I think an opportunity that we have as we continue to move forward with COVID is to rely on our neighbors in those countries who have lived experience of mass trauma, but don't have the ability or the time or the funding to get it out in publications. And so I share this, the IASC Interagency Standing Committee briefing note. This group who's been working and offering psychosocial support globally for years in humanitarian settings. And I would encourage us to continue to ask the questions from folks, maybe from the less sort of formal academic avenues on how should we move forward and think of new ideas to recognize ways that we can support each other. A key element of that support that we've learned um, across the board is one of camaraderie. And I'll move towards that idea in just a minute. Again, I'm so appreciative of this opportunity to talk through these challenging issues because as James Baldwin reminds us, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing will change if it's not faced. Though it's unknown and challenging, we need to stay courageous to ask questions across the board and across the globe on how we can grow and improve. And going back to what Dr. Cates mentioned is that the traumas and the PTSD and the PTG that our caregivers are experiencing, some will experience later on after the fact, but we know this is ongoing for a long time. So another question to ask is, how do we make our work sustainable? How do we build our empathetic resonance? Meaning, when we walk into a space, whether it's a boardroom or a patient care room, how do we attach, connect with the emotions we're experiencing and let our patients, our colleagues, our friends know with a sense of vulnerability that we are here to care for them? And how do we build that to a sense of compassionate resonance in a way that we not only are witnessing and experiencing someone else's suffering or challenges, but compassion means doing something about it. And so as we look at resilience and the care that we give, we need to stay open to creative ways to address our empathy and compassion as we connect with people. A couple programs that I shared in the last meeting that we're running at Nursery and uh, at Emory, um, and very similarly to what it sounds like you all are doing under Dr. Kate's leadership, um, are multiple platforms in person, online, to connect, to encourage connect, to re-encourage connection. The Emergency Nurses Association in sponsorship with the American Nurses Association and the American Nurses Foundation has launched a nationwide platform for nurses to come together in Zoom, um, facilitated Zoom chats to talk through what's going on so that we continue to converse and talk. And I think it's our role as leaders to collect the information of what people are sharing and to change our systems based on the ideas and the real-time needs of our nurses and colleagues. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the, this next poem, and if I have a minute, we'll come back to it. It's called Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. And if you have a chance to Google it, I'd encourage you to read it, sit with it, pause, and consider what that means to you in your work as we build resilience so that we can keep moving forward. And I'd like to end with one last theme, leaving some space for a Q&A, recognizing that I don't know if there are many universals on this planet, but one thing that might be close to a universal is a sense of camaraderie, camaraderie between healthcare workers. Some of the work I've done at Emory, I've been meeting with nurses and technicians and front desk staff sometimes in the middle of the night to cover night shifts, sometimes during the day, and just asking, what, is, what are you doing for self-care? 
what's working, what's not working, and what are your experiences here? And a theme that has come up in these conversations, and I've heard this verbatim from two different caregivers, was that I actually feel safer when I come to work treating COVID patients. We know we've got the PPE we need, and we know that's key, but we also know that we're surrounded by a team of people with a collective goal to support lives, to save lives, to provide hope. And folks say they feel less safe going home because they're not surrounded by all these talented, brilliant caregivers. So as leaders, what can we do to build that sense of camaraderie, celebrate that sense of camaraderie, and as things change, which they will, because change constantly happens, how do we keep that in the forefront as a sense to recognize our post-traumatic growth together, move towards that while also holding space for those who need a higher level of care because of symptoms of post-traumatic growth? I'd like to end and, and thank you all for your time. My e email address is here. This is an image that Diala sent to me called Fighters that she asked that I share in my presentations to share with all the caregivers that I connect with to recognize the connections between the arts and humanity and the ongoing need for the work that we do together. I'd like to hand the conversation back over to Shelley. Thank you all again and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you both, uh, Tim and David. Uh, certainly gives us a lot to uh, consider and uh, think through, um, for sure. So I just want a, a couple of reminders here um, that Need Tech is here to help, and you have our websites there to reach out if you have any trouble with your certificate or your CME stuff, or you have questions in general or technical assistance we can help with. So let's go to questions. So there's a couple questions in the Q&A box, so I'm going to direct these. So um, one of the questions, and Tim, I'll direct this to you, it sounds like you're saying this is not going away. The new normal, how does this fit for the many Americans who do not want to be controlled through a mask? That in and of itself is causing PS PTSD for some of us. Absolutely. Your thoughts on that? Yes, thank you for sending that one my way, Shelly. And Donald, thank you for asking that question. Um, that's, that's challenging. It's absolutely true that um, masks are causing PTSD type symptoms for some people. Um, also sort of the American mindset of, of being a, a free country, we have the right to choose. There are a lot of complications that way for certain. One thing that we learned in the Ebola response and the country of Liberia did this, I think particularly well, was that when those countries started shutting down, Liberia took a public health education approach as compared to Sierra Leone, which took a military approach, roadblocks, let's shut everything down. And Liberia, I think, got ahead of some of their cases by trying to designate time to sit and speak with people and provide up-to-date knowledge and education as to why these decisions are being put in place. Fast forward to today, something that we're trying at Emory, to be honest, we're struggling with having our staff all wear masks within our health system, and that's a policy here. So our approach is when we encounter someone not wearing a mask, rather than saying you have to do this because you're causing harm to someone else, it begins with a question. May I ask why you're choosing not to wear a mask? Can we talk about it? And the other question is, do you need help getting a mask? Because we're realizing a lot of people don't have access and they're afraid to ask. So. I don't have a good answer for that, but I think it begins with asking and education to help reduce some of that tension that we're all feeling um, to help encourage folks to wear masks. If I could chime in on the, th that great answer. Um, in, in the literature on quarantine, when um, governments are asking people to quarantine, which is uh, even more uh, intrusive than wearing a mask, one of the uh, findings is that when you can appeal to people's sense of altruism, um, it helps. So the coercive, um, as Tim was saying, uh, kind of interventions are not, are often not effective and people sort of cheat and don't follow it. But when, when they feel they're doing something to help other people, um, and that kind of taps into some of the content of, in terms of tenderness and camaraderie um, that Tim was talking about. So that's another, another way to approach it as well. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm going to direct this next question to David. So if you're a rural facility, who 
do you think uh, would be good recommendations to serve on your peer team? So I'll, I'll answer that with a little bit of a backstory to how we ended up with our proactive peer supporters. So just to be clear, we have two different sets of people. We have the behavioral health response team, and those are behavioral health clinicians. We trained over 100 of them. And so when those referrals come in to work with the people in quarantine, the, the nurses who've lost patients or the self-referrals, um, that's, that's who's doing those. But the proactive peer support program, which I think may be what, um, what you're referring to, we actually piggybacked on a program that got stalled. So we were in the middle of doing this, um, what we call uh, this culture training. And this had nothing to do with COVID. It preceded it. And we're, we're trying to sort of, it, it had a cascading model where we chained the senior leadership and then the directors and managers um, in this intervention, really around sort of good mental hygiene is what it is, mental health hygiene. But in any case, the managers who had large departments were all asked to identify culture uh, leaders. With, so these were not people in formal leadership positions, but people who could carry the message forward with their team. And so we identified over 100 of them. And then the program stalled. We got very much sidetracked with COVID. So I asked our HR team if I could just use that group that had already been identified and, and ask who was interested in being trained. And most of them were. So we ended up training that group. But the point, the larger, so that's the story. The point is there were informal leaders, people that managers looked at as um, as positive, as um, you know, outgoing, socially intelligent people. So I would, for the proactive peer support program, and again, you can actually see what we train, the model we use. You can look at the PowerPoints right in that re repository. I would suggest having team leads and managers identify the people on their teams that they think are most apt to be comfortable reaching out and have a high EQ, uh, emotional intelligence quotient, as it were. If I may follow up with that, David, you know, I think also the power of peer support in, in this situation, um, for one is, you know, for the amount of people so strongly affected by COVID, we might not have enough um, highly trained providers to go around to give that high level of one-on-one -on -one care. Um, and also something that we've learned about, and I'm sure is not unfamiliar to you all, there's still a, a sort of a stigma against certain levels of seeking therapeutic care. And, and we found that by working with peers, other folks are willing to talk with a peer maybe a little more rapidly than, than, than a, a therapist per se. So I think it's a, a really beautiful and holistic way to, to sort of spread the connection and, and support folks. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions actually asks about the peer support how do you address concerns about confidentiality and how do you address a situation when maybe the person um, doesn't want to be approached by the peer or that isn't welcomed? Any suggestions for that scenario? Yeah, so we sort of trained for that. We, we anticipate that will happen in some cases. This is David. Um, and so we um, do a couple of things. First of all, we make sure, as I mentioned before, that the manager or the team leader lets everyone know, look, this person's been trained. They may be reaching out. Don't take offense. That's their job now. You know, that's part of what they're doing. And, um, you know, and if you don't want to talk to them, just let them know. And then when we train the peers, we just tell them how to gently broach the conversation. Um, so they're not diving right in, but they're just saying, hey, how's it going? Or, you know, I noticed you seem a little stressed recently. Or you don't quite seem like yourself. And they have to feel their way through. If somebody is clearly not interested, um, then they back off. We can't impose it on people. And it's definitely not to be a situation where like someone else, a third party says, hey, go talk to this person, you know, um, because it's, it's really a, just like any peer, right? Any, anybody that you would ever check in with, you say, how's it going? And if, if they seem open to your bid, then you continue. But if they seem closed down, you kind of got to read that and, and let it go. So um, there's no perfect answer. But we let people know that not everybody may be comfortable. And if they feel they're not, they, you know, just to, just to back off. Try maybe approaching them differently later um, and just say, oh, you know, fine. I'm just, just, just concerned. Uh, as far as confidentiality, I mean, there is no, it, this is not a clinical uh, arrangement. So, you know, we ask the peers to keep it, to respect privacy. Um, and it's a question of trust. And, and that's why we try to pick natural leaders who we think are, uh, trusted and you know looked up to by the staff. 
Great, thank you. And then we'll finish up with this question and I'll ask you both to respond. What sort of activities can we do during team meetings to promote resilience? I've got two quick answers for you. One is don't overload your agendas as leaders, leave space for conversation. We know when a sense of autonomy is lost, so too senses of burnout can increase. So leave space within your agendas. Secondly, take a time to pause at the beginning or ending of the meetings to reflect on the work of the team, to acknowledge the team, and maybe acknowledge what's going on either in your hospital or outside to let people know that voices are being heard and recognized. Great answer. I'm not sure I have much to add other than uh, one of the core components of resilience is social support. And to the extent you can build that support in your team, and there's a million different ways to do that, uh, you are in fact increasing resilience just by um, building cohesion and a sense of community in your team. And of course, there are individual exercises. And take a look at the April webinar where we, we go through in some detail what, what some of those techniques are. All right, well, we are at the end of our time. I just wanna remind you all that the slide deck as well as the audio file will be available on netech.org website. We wanna thank our presenters today and uh, really thank all of you for tuning in for this very important topic as we uh, ride the wave of COVID. Thank you.